job to have to break people's hearts sometimes. I will stand behind my opinion. It's not right. Really pretty replica coin. I think this one's worth three grand? Of course not. The man shows Rick oh, an ancient shit. Byzantine coin and demands $1,900. Rick didn't get to call in the experts and bought it after a heated negotiation. Coin from the Byzantine Empire. Books what? From an antique store a while back. It was actually inside the spine. Now in 300 something, moved the capital of the Roman Empire to Constantinople. Backbone of their economy was coins like this. They were recognized all over the world. You have Christ seated at a throne. And they depicted Christ there as more of a king than as a martyr. How much you want for it? 1900 It's not as big as you would think. You're probably right around 1100 I'm thinking. You see how thin the coin is? Yes. I'll give you like 800 bucks for it. Nah, that's, that's a little bit too low. You know, that... The condition's not great. 16 <laughs> You went from 1900 to 800 That's crazy. I'll go 1100 bucks. Yeah, I guess we can do 11 Normally, I'd call my coin guy on something like this, but my gut told me, just pull the trigger and buy it. Rick shows David his coin. He carefully examines it and determines it is worth much less than Rick paid. Here's the coin. Ah, it's fantastic. He, this interesting cup shape that it has was introduced under Constantine the Ninth. He's on the reverse. Jesus Christ is on the obverse, the front. I have a comparison coin here for you. And this coin is as flat as a pancake. This one is like a shot glass. Well, this coin is not dated any more specifically than the reign of Constantine the Ninth. So sometime between 1042 and 1055 AD. What's it worth? Thousand years old, very close to it. It's gold. Are not always worth what people might think they are for between 700 and a thousand dollars in this condition. I was just thinking it would be more. I mean, it's a gold coin that's almost a thousand. Yo, he lost money. Bro, why would you not get an expert? You pay what? For, uh, like 1100 for this coin? You didn't think to get an expert, bro? Are you serious? Come on, bro. It's terribly undervalued. All right, not the news I was exactly looking for. Well, that was shocking news I for Rick, money. but lessons learned. Lesson learned. I'll call you next time. Yeah, call me first. <laughs> All right, thanks, man. <laughs> Thank you. That's crazy. I always say that a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. And I didn't know nearly as much about Byzantine coins as I thought I did. I might have to sit on this one for a while and wait for prices to go up. The woman walks into the pawn shop and hands over her supposedly hand-carved ivory tusk to Rick. Rick immediately notices something suspicious about this item. An ivory tusk. Okay. Hand carved. I would hope that I could get somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred for it. I want to pawn it seven to ten days. Okay. Some money between now and it's four o'clock. So how'd you get this thing? I bought it in Taipei. I paid a lot. Okay. <laughs> Rick, thanks to his experience, finds out that this isn't ivory, but rather pieces of bone put together to look like one. Unfortunately, it's not ivory. This yeah. is bone. It's pieced together bone, and it's made for the tourist trade. It only took like two seconds to tell this wasn't ivory. They were in Asia. They went to a market they were told they were ivory i was told it was ivory ivory would be a lot heavier than this bone is porous ivory is completely solid see the panels the way they come together like that well if it was real ivory it would just be one solid piece cut up pieces of bone and they shape it around a piece of wood and this is what you get you can see the wood that's underneath it i'm not really interested in buying ivory anymore i don't like the process of getting ivory i don't like the politics of it i don't like anything about it rick ruined the day for this one isn't that illegal how much were you looking to get out of it thousand to fifteen i would loan you like a hundred dollars on this do a little bit better it's not real it's bone okay it's, it's beautiful i don't loan on pretty i loan on what I can sell it for. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you. It was ivory, and years and years later, now I'm finding out that it's not. Very upset. The woman shows Rick and Mr. Harrison her Mark Twain stock certificate and demands 500 bucks for it. A stock certificate that was made out to one of the greatest American authors, Mark Twain. From the Goodman Gold and Silver Mining Company, Virginia City, Nevada, Mark Twain said that a gold mine is a hole in the ground with a liar at the bottom. Where did you get this? To an estate sale, and he bought some books, and as he was going through the book, he found it. Do you know what Mark Twain means? He was a riverboat pilot, and you just didn't go down the Mississippi River. You had to navigate down it. And when you dropped your line into the water and you had 12 feet of clearance, you marked the Twain, which meant clear to go. His name is not Mark Twain. No, though. Samuel it's, Clemens. It's Samuel Clemens, the best known American writer ever. The most important works of American literature, like Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. Now, how much did you want for it? $500. Okay. Rick had some concerns regarding the certificate, and it turns out it's a fake one. That was a close call, wasn't it? Here's some big concerns I have about it. Okay. This is supposedly a stock certificate where the shares are worth $100 a piece, and he has 100 shares. Would you put that stock certificate in your pen name 
or your real name? I read that they put it in really? the Mark Twain name. I have never seen a stock certificate printed like this. If you own stock in a company, you presented your stock and your dividends were paid. If it was printed this simple, anybody could counterfeit it. Just everything about it screams fake. I wish it was real. I mean, he's one of my favorite characters in history. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. So the man shows Rick his rare Claude That's Monet painting and some paperwork and hopes to get paid in millions. Claude Monet painting. Where in the hell did you get this? Uh, collateral for a loan. No, actually, he took the money, went to the hospital, and died. Do you have a date or anything else like that when it was done, when it was painted? I Is don't. There a, there a title to it? It was just... I don't. He started arguably one of the biggest art movements ever, the Impressionist movement. Impressionism is named after his painting Impression Sunrise. Hmm. That's why his paintings are worth so much money. Yo, this painting in the back? They were a little bit blurry. That's Impressionism. But you could still see detail, and that's why they go for millions. The insurance policy for that painting... This painting in the back is beautiful, Displayed by the, at the way. Las Vegas Museum of Fine Arts. May 1st, 1965. Our findings as as follows. The painting is solidly constructed, casual canvas, a typical Claude Monet from his early period. Rick is not an art expert, so he brings in Brett, who immediately sees a few red flags pointing toward one thing, that the painting is fake. I am not qualified to say if this is real or not. Let me get a friend down here. When you think of fine art masters, Monet's right up there near the top of the heap. Important artistic movement of the last 200 years. The way that they were able to configure and juxtapose, started painting very early, so what's early period? It doesn't, doesn't really tell you a whole lot of Monet's brush strokes. Impressionists were all about as the name would end, he usually had some texture in his pieces, and this, again, there's very little of that. He also was known for having a very, you know, vibrant palette. All of the master works that you see, if it's authentic, this could be a, a $5 million piece. I'd like to get a second opinion, and just because there's a few red flags that I see, he may not see it that way. Brett brings in Gerard for a second opinion on the painting, who also determines that it doesn't belong to Monet. The man that I go to in our gallery, yeah. when we have masterpieces come through just to verify authenticity. Before to look at the name, you look at the technique. It will be a very important Monet because the size. He is a painter from the outdoors, from the landscapes. Monet is, uh, is known for that quality. If we look on the back of this painting, at the texture, the canvas, you will have all the old paint sweating through the canvas. Here you don't see that. 150 years old, see cracks in the painting, absolutely not one crack. That's interesting. Monet will have showed this with shadows. This will be much more pronounced. This is too flat. So is it real? And not so real. Not real. Ugh. The man walks into the pawn shop shows Rick his pair of Scottish blades and demands a whopping four grand for them. I got a couple of Scottish blades here. For a knife? Down from me from my dad. My grandfather was overseas around World War II and he had bought these over there. So do you know anything about these? Called the Dirk and this is the dagger around the 18th century. Well, I'd like to sell them, 4,000. Before Rick throws away his money, he notices that the big dagger might be a fake, but to examine the little guy, Rick brings in Jeff. This is a reproduction. This is not silver, this is really poorly sandcasted all Damn. along here. This is photo etching along here. They put a photo negative above the blade. They put some chemicals on the blade. They blast some light on it. The acid reacts with the light and zap, it's there. This one I'm confident is not worth anything. That, that really sucks. This on the other <laughs> hand looks real. It's definitely silver. That's a lot of work right there. It looks like it's a modern cut stone. And the hallmarks are gonna tell us where it's made, who it's made by, what year it's made. Call on an expert, have them check it out. Sounds good. I'm an expert in knives and militaria. Journey that these items have been on. Absolutely amazing to me. Jeff examines the blade and determines that it's the real deal, which is more than enough of a reason for Rick to buy it. So what are your concerns about it? I can't read the hallmarks on the back. Then this is a modern cut stone on the top of it. Proper form of a Scottish dagger. The end of the handle here was actually intentional. They would slip this into their sock, this would protrude, allowing them to easily grab the dagger. Outwardly facing design, smooth on the backside where it would be against the skin. This is called a cairngorm, common for these stones to fall out and be replaced. Made in Scotland, has the Scottish thistle mark on it, was 1900. So what do you think something like this is worth? 800 to 1200 dollars. Now that Jeff has confirmed this Damn. dagger is 100% real, I definitely want it. What do you want for it? Maybe six. I give you like 400 bucks for it. That's just too low. I'll go 500 bucks. $500, we'll do that. The man shows Corey and Chumley his ninth. Wait, 
That was a freaking scam. He robbed that guy from his knife, dude. 1967 autographed Chicago Bears football and demands 10 grand. 1967 autographed Chicago Bears football. My uncle gave me the ball, given to him by Ronnie Bull, a Chicago player. You can see him handing it there. 60s pro football wasn't at the level of college football yet. Could local businessmen in the area please give the players jobs during the uh, right. offseason right. so they uh, don't have to leave town to find work? This is cool because it comes from a time when pro football was just starting to explode in popularity. The big name to me is George Hallis because this is the last year that George Hallis was a head coach. Gail Sayers and Brian Piccolo on it, right? Both of them. Brian Piccolo's signature is pretty rare. He died at the age of 26 and became a legend because of his story. This thing could be worth a lot of money. Any particular amount you're looking for? $10,000. Corey calls in Jeremy to authenticate the football, which he does. It turns out that most signatures are counterfeit. Absolutely no authentication for the ball. Do you mind if I give a buddy of mine a call? He can kind of appraise it. Sure, that's fine with me. No other team in the NFL has more wins than the Chicago Bears. The 1967 season was absolutely huge. Coach George Hallis, after 40 years, that was his last year coaching. But we have Gail Sayre, and he's the youngest guy ever to be inducted in the Hall of Fame. But Dick Buckus, who's in the Hall of Fame as well. Right here we have Brian Piccolo, who at this time, he was just a backup Gail Sayers. George Hallis, legendary coach, official ball, mint condition signatures. We'd be talking several thousand dollars. These uh, signatures are very difficult to fake. 100% spot on exactly what I want to see in a 1967 ball. Now, the other signatures, you really got to focus on the characteristics of the autograph compared against other ones that have been proven to be authentic. In my opinion, these are clubhouse autographs. Somebody knows the signature Damn. and does their best interpretation of it to try to make it look as authentic as possible. Which ones are real versus which ones are clubhouse? You're looking at it maybe a thousand bucks. Corey offers less than the owner expected. There is no deal for today. All right, man, so you heard my guy. I'd offer you around 100 bucks for it. So I'll just keep holding on to it. I'd like <laughs> to meet the people that do that, give them a piece of my mind. The man shows Rick his... You will never meet them, bro. You will never His prototype meet Colt Patterson revolver, a potentially holy grail of guns. Rick seems very interested and suspicious, so he calls in the expert. Colt Patterson that I'm interested in selling. A prototype. Where did you get this? Auction company had this on the internet. This was the first reliable revolver. They used them to conquer the last remaining sections of the Wild West. I mean, it's a neat design. That's why the uh, trigger tucked in. And then once you pulled it back, this would be like a holy grail item for gun collectors. How much did you pay for it? About four thousand huh. dollars. Okay. My big concern is it's not real. I think it's a prototype. Position of those screws. It could be worth anywhere between fifty and hundred thousand dollars. Let me get someone down here to take a look band. at this thing. Jemison examines the gun, which turns out to be fake. Jemison, how's it going? All right. That old, I feel bad for that old man, bro. He paid four band for this cheap fake ass a factory gun. in Patterson, New Jersey. Is the wear on this pistol is completely wrong. Let's make some comparison. This is the definitive book on Colt Patterson's. The lug on this barrel is much bigger than the one here the angle of the back strap here on this gun more severe none of them look like this is it real it's not real Damn. well that's a bullet to the head for the owner i would have loved for this thing to have been real let me give you fifty thousand dollars for it thanks okay of course i'm disappointed i wish it was the real thing the man shows Corey and Chumley Mickey Mantle's Bible and offers $1,500. But Corey needs to get it checked out first. Bible today. It better be real old. <laughs> A handwritten letter on the back cover from Mickey Mantle to Roger Maris in 1977. Mickey Mantle was one of the greatest players of all time, but he had a lifelong struggle with alcoholism. Any Yankees fan, it would be like the Holy Grail or something like that. Letter to Roger Maris. Apparently, he was in rehab while he wrote it because he had took more than a couple trips there. For an autograph like this, the money's all in the story. I want to thank you for your kind letters. I never thought our friendship would reach past the playing field. God bless Mickey Mantle. Got it certified or? I haven't thought about sending it off a PSA. Think it might be worth? $1,500. Let me have a buddy of mine that authenticates for a PSA. The expert carefully examines the content of the letter inside the Bible, and it turns out that the Bible doesn't belong to the late baseball star. Mantle wrote anything you know, along the lines with good content to Roger Maris. You're looking at some huge money. Tape was kind of applied to it first. Bought some examples of what we're looking at here, just in general. We're looking at a, a signature with speed, with flow, spontaneity. Mickey Mantle never signed this. Thanks, Steve. All right, guys, good to see you, man. Thanks right, for coming right. down. The woman shows Rick her continental currency and demands...
Bro, most of this video is these sell these people that came to Pawn Stars. These people got a scam, bro. I would like to see like Rick getting it's 10 scammed grand more, for bro. it. But in reality, this could be worth half a million dollars. But before that, it needs to Damn. be authenticated. A piece of continental currency from 1776. Half a like mil for a coin? Up to ten thousand dollars. Up to like half a million dollars. This is one of the most desirable coins in the United States. I bought my house and I got to keep all of the stuff that was in it. This is one of those things. It's basically our first coin. This coin was partially designed by Benjamin Franklin. It has all the 13 colonies on it. And on the back, we are one. You have to make sure it's real. Have you had this checked out by anybody? Wow. No. Continental currency coins are probably the most faked coins. Okay. Rick brings in a weighing machine and it turns out the coin is counterfeit. Well, it has no place in the pawn shop. These were made out of pewter, which is a very lightweight metal. To make sure it weighs right. Okay. A real one of these weighs between 15 and 18 grams, 27.4. Really pretty replica coin. Thanks for bringing it in, though. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. The man shows Rick his 1960s Rolling Stones promo album and demands $4,000. Rick calls in Warwick to authenticate it. Got a Rolling Stones record here I think you might want to buy. Edition collector's item. Distributed only to radio stations. Came out in the late 60s. One of those weird records they go crazy for. This is more or less a compilation. Walking the dog, Susie Q, who doesn't know that? I mean, how much were you asking for it? $4,000. Let me call a friend of mine Damn. and he will know what this thing is worth. He'll... Warwick immediately exposes the truth and calls it a fake worth less than 150 bucks. Well, it's up to Rick now. Will he still buy it? There is no Rolling Stone. If he buys it, he's going to offer like dirt low prices, like Stones 70 bucks, 60 bucks. The Rolling Stones have it all. There's always been a big market for those rarities. Yeah, well, what's it worth? Yeah. $3,000. You think this one's worth three grand? Of course not. The one we're looking for doesn't <laughs> say collector's item. Manufactured in Australia for about 150 bucks. 50 bucks. About 100. 60 bucks on it. 65. You know what? I'll give you the 65 bucks for it. Okay. Okay. The man shows Rick and Corey his one-of-a-kind vintage silver baby rattle, but Rick needs to examine it first. Ew. It's a baby rattle from the early 1800s. It's sterling silver, got a whistle, and some bells on it. Cat and the fiddle and the cow jumped over the moon on it, and it's got a sterling mark. And the whistle does work, those. Antibacterial properties on it. This is made by Gorham. That's an American silver company. They started off in the 1830s, 1840s, right around then. If you were rich in the 1800s and want to flaunt it, this is what you spent your money on. Well, let me take a look. <laughs> um... After a quick examination, the rattle turned out to be a fake. If you look at the hallmark, it's from 1860 to like 1890, so we know it's not really early stuff. It's not a silver solder because you can see it turning green right in there. It's fake. Pit marks everywhere. I don't think this is a... Bro. A lot of people that buy these are fucking stupid. They either don't authenticate it or like just came here just to try it out and see what happens. See if they got lucky, bro. They didn't even like authenticate it, bro. Original, I, mean, I, guess I think someone put this in there. Job. Plowed right through the middle of this Damn. little scene with the cow jumping over the moon. It doesn't seem like something Gorham would do. Is that real pearl on it? Um, Yeah, that's real mother of pearl, but yeah, mother of pearl is inexpensive. I'm going to pass. Well, if you bought it off a friend, maybe you get your money back. The man shows Corey a shrunken head and demands five grand for it. But Ew. first, Corey needs to know whether it's the real deal. Shrunken head, man. Who the fuck buys that? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, there was these tribes in the Amazon. They figured out a way to shrink people's heads. The whole purpose behind it, I guess, was to show what a tough guy you were. I mean, it looks real. It's really hard to come across an actual shrunken head. So what are you looking to get out of it? I'd like to get somewhere around $5,000 for it. I'll tell you what, do you mind Ew. if I do a video chat real quick with a buddy of mine and have him take a look at this? That would be what great. Corey fuck? talks to Bob, who helps examine the head. It turns out it's not real. I have what looks like a shrunken head here. Shrunken heads have been around for a long time. Most of them come from Ecuador. These are warriors. They've taken a head in battle, removed the face off of the skull, and then it's heated with hot sand, which the heat will cause that skin to shrink. If you're a really good head shrinker, you can get a head that's about the size of an orange. Could you give me an idea on how to tell if this is real or not? The tribes that were making them discovered that if they sold Ew. them to tourists, they could make a lot of money. Look inside the nostril. No nostril. We look at the ears. I got no ear holes. I think we got a fake here. Give me an idea of what something like this is worth. 10 grand for it. As a tourist piece, I'd say it's worth 200 bucks. Clearly it's not real. Man.
Corey still makes an offer, but the owner doesn't seem to want to sell it at such a low price. He probably bought it for a lot of money. Maybe 200 bucks. It just really reminds me of a buddy of mine, and I kind of wanted it for myself. For 200 bucks, it's worth bringing back and putting on the shelf. Did you do 300? No, man. I want to bring it back home, put it back up on the shelf, and uh, enjoy it. That's so creepy. Just Curfew sell it, years. dude. Damn.